Stanford University. Well, thank you very much, Jim, for introducing me. I, I thought you were going to say you can guarantee that I graduated, <laughs> which hopefully you can as well. Uh, I'd like to congratulate Dr. Sally Benson for not only your leadership in GSEP, but also for organizing this great two-day symposium. And I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of Dr. Xi, as well as your outstanding presentation to launch these proceedings. So it's, a, it's an honor to be here. As you know, China and the US have many things in common with energy. Together, we emit half of the greenhouse gas emissions on the planet. Uh, in the US, less than or around 5% of the population consumes 25% of the energy. So clearly, this is not sustainable. And so I think it's a very appropriate topic entitled to talk about energy sustainability and creating a sustainable energy future for the 21st century. I'm also pleased that China and the US have partnered together on a series of clean energy research centers in buildings, carbon capture and storage, and also electric vehicles. So I'll say a few words about that later on. But it is indeed an honor and a pleasure to be back at my alma mater. And I've, I've uh, seen some, uh, I would say, old friends, but young friends that I've known for a number of years. So it's uh, doubly pleasurable to be here. I want to say a little bit of um, personal introduction here with the, the next slide. And that is that I am serving the Obama administration, as Dr. Plummer said, at a, quite an interesting time. And it reminds me of my last year of getting my PhD here because my advisor put a deadline on when I had to finish my experiments. So there was a sense of urgency. And I feel that right now we are facing another sense of urgency where we don't have the time to just study for the sake of study's sake. We actually have to work, act now. And what we do over the next decade to two decades will determine if we have created, for those that come after us, a sustainable future. So with that sense of urgency, I start with this slide, which also goes back to my youth. This is Grinnell Glacier in Glacier National Park. And in April, the USGS said that the majority of glaciers in Glacier National Park are actually receding. In fact, only 25 of them are now large enough to be called a glacier, which means they have to be 25 acres or larger. That was a first scene was of the glaciers in 1938. About the time I was finishing my master's degree and going into PhD, this is what Grinnell Glacier looked like. And then later in 1998, you can see it receding, and in 2005, breaking off, and in 2009, almost disappearing. USGS believes that the rest of the glaciers may be gone by the end of this next decade. So yes, I do believe that humans have a role in climate change, and therefore, it was a great pleasure to be asked to join the administration and to work side by side with my boss, Secretary Chu, to carry out the goals of the President Obama with regard to reducing our greenhouse gas emissions 17% by 2020, 42% by 2030, and 83% by 2050. Also to reduce our dependence on imported oil by roughly 30%. We import about 10 uh, million barrels per day. So to reduce that by about 30%, uh, we're looking at decreasing our export of almost $300 billion a year by reducing our use, conservation, as well as efficiency. We want to maintain our science and engineering leadership. This is something that, of course, Stanford plays a huge role in. And clean up the legacy of the Cold War, as well as build a clean energy economy. So I'm going to focus today on just talking about how can we achieve 83% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. And um, as uh, Dr. Benson said earlier, it will take a portfolio approach. But I think this slide illustrates the challenge that we have. Because in the United States, the average time it takes to migrate from one primary source of energy to another has been about 80 to 100 years. And if we're going to change our dependence on carbon intensive energy, which is about 85% fossil, 15% non-fossil energy now, to flip that to 15% from fossil intensive and 85% from low carbon, including carbon capture and sequestration from fossil sources by 2050, we'll have to cut in, in, in half the time it takes to migrate to these new forms of energy. So I mentioned that. Because some say 
that it can't be done, that it's either too difficult or will cost too much. And this is an editorial that appeared in the Wall Street Journal by Richard Lester, who's a um, professor at MIT and chair of the nuclear engineering program there. And I think skepticism is healthy, but I think hopeless pessimism is unwarranted at this time. So if you read this article, and it's from December 3rd, it was about a week before I went to Copenhagen, so it was a little chilling. Uh, what um, Dr. Lester is saying is that in order to achieve 83% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, by 2050, we'd have to have five times the nuclear power plants as we do today. So we'd have to have 500. Today we have about 104 plants, 104 reactors at 66 plants. Um, we've done some analysis because I think it's important that we really put into context with assumptions that are historically um, consistent what it will take. And so I'm going to talk about that today. Uh, Dr. Lester went on to say that it would take 100 times the solar power that was installed in 2008 every year for the next 40 years, which would be 1,400 gigawatts. In wind, it would take 30 gigawatts per year for the next 40 years, or 1,200 gigawatts of wind. And coal, we'd have to build twice the coal-fired plants we have today. It's about four, 1,470 plants today by 2050. And uh, not much was mentioned about natural gas. So the question is, it all comes down to assumptions and starting conditions and, and, and you know, what is realistic. So I'd like to talk a little bit about what I think will get us to 83% by 2050. And I think that one of the first things that we need to do and was mentioned is the energy efficiency. So we consume about 100 quads of energy today. And in our strategic technology energy uh, plan that we've been studying for the last year, what will it take to get to 83%? We want to make sure that energy efficiency keeps our consumption flat. So if we're consuming 100 quads in 2010, we're consuming 100 quads out of 2050. Now, what will that take? Historically, our energy intensity has decreased in the US by minus 1.77% per year. OK, 1.8%. In our plan, in our model, what we assume is that with an emphasis on energy efficiency, we can increase that to minus 2.3%. It's about a 30% difference. OK, seems reasonable. The next is the three sources is, of course, we're going to have to increase our renewable energy. We will have to decarbonize the electrical sector. We will have to electrify the transportation sector. We'll have to add nuclear and carbon capture and storage. So this curve extrapolates from the Energy Information Agency, where we emit over 5.5 gigatons per year of CO2 in 2010, down from 2005, a little bit because of the recession. Business as usual would put us out at above 7 gigatons out at 2050. So with that simple extrapolation of business as usual, usual, EIA goes out to 2035. I just extended it to 2050. We can walk through what it would actually take to decarbonize the electrical sector, electrify the transportation sector, and do energy efficiency at scale, which would get us to 1.3 gigatons out of 2050, which would be 83% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Now, the interesting thing about 1.3 gigatons to me out of 2050 is a lot of the carbon capture and reuse, whether it's in cement making or plastics or in some of the processes, Dr. Shi, you mentioned about steel making being coming more efficient, it's significant at 1.3 gigatons, not so much at 6 gigatons. But if you can reuse 50 million tons a year, that's a lot when you're at a base of 1.3. So I think a lot of the things that we're looking at at the Department of Energy, including our American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, our innovative carbon capture and storage program, where we announced about 12 to 16 new projects, they actually become significant in 2050, where they don't look so significant today. So the first part of the portfolio, of course, is part of the solution is going to be solar. And we, in our strategic technology energy plan, are looking at 380 gigawatts out of 2050. So it's a roughly 0.34 petawatt hours. And what DOE is doing to help enhance that is we've looked at loan guarantees in, for uh, companies like Solyndra in the PV market. We've looked at loan guarantees for BrightSource. And I think you might have read just a couple days ago that California approved the BrightSource uh, 370 megawatt concentrating solar power project, which um, will be on the border of California and Nevada. It's a $1.1 billion project. The loan guarantee is over a billion dollars from DOE. And it will provide electricity to two-thirds to PG&E customers and about a third to the Southern California Edison. So we have great plans for solar, but 380 gigawatts. We think that can be done between now and 2050. 
Now, with regard to the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, we actually put uh, $36.5 billion into clean energy, smart grid, carbon capture, sequestration, and also conditionally, un uh, conditionally approved two loan guarantees in the nuclear space. So if you look at the trajectory here out to 2010, you can see um, that if we can maintain that momentum, we would greatly increase the amount of deployment of solar and wind. And we hope that the Recovery Act will double the amount of solar and wind over the next couple of years. A lot of this will depend on regulatory um, production tax credits, hopefully, that we will have in order to move forward and actually realize what we've been doing. But by the end of this week, we will have invested in 15 gigawatts of new wind, solar, and geothermal projects. So we believe that the portfolio could be as much as a third by 2050 in renewable energy. Now, a lot of the opportunity in renewable energy also has to do with taking advantage of pump storage. And so this is a, a typical pump storage facility. This is actually in Warren, Pennsylvania, uh, Warren County. And it turns out that the pump storage potential in California is probably about 6.5 quads, which is significant. It's a significant percentage of our 100 quad of um, energy use. When I think about pump storage and I see water, I think about the kind of plants that my, my father and my grandfather working with Westinghouse helped uh, work on, including Hoover Dam. And I, I think that most people don't know that of the 82,000 dams installed in the US, only 3% produce electricity. So when we think about renewable energy, I think very few people recognize we could double the amount of hydro, especially now with more fish-friendly turbines, and run a river where you don't have to dam. We see there's a huge uptick that could be potentially uh, employed with base load clean energy from hydro. And so this is an area that we're quite interested in. So again, taking into account geothermal, hydro, solar, wind, and waste to energy, we believe one possible scenario is that by 2050, we could have as much as 30% renewable energy, which is also reasonable to be integrated onto the grid. So that's sort of the first leg of the stool. Second leg of the stool to decarbonizing our electric sector is to expand the use of emission or nearly emission-free nuclear power. So as I said earlier, there's 104 reactors at 66 plants. In our planning, we're looking at increasing this by roughly another 100 plants by 2050, which if you think about back to the 70s at the time when we were uh, heavily building nuclear power plants in this country, that's roughly after 2020, if we can build between three and five by 2020, that's something like less than four a year. At the height of our nuclear energy, uh, in the 70s, we we're building as many as 11 to 13 a year. So this is very reasonable. So possibly out of 2050, a third of our energy could come from nuclear. The last piece of decarbonizing the electric sector, we've invested about $3.5 billion in carbon capture and sequestration projects, including Future Gen 2.0 our car carbon capture partnership with industry program, as well as our innovative carbon capture and storage project. Now, this is a slide from Mountaineer, a plant, an AEB, AEP plant in West Virginia. We actually uh, were there to open up the 1.5 million se ton sequestration part of this particular plant. It's 1,300 gigawatts. We're taking a 10% slipstream, or roughly uh, 100. 235 megawatts to sequester it as a test, and this is operating uh, right now. And so this is one of the test pilots, and these are the kinds of projects that DOE does in order to give the market a signal and information about the, the cost and the operation efficiency of carbon capture and sequestration. We believe, 2050, that in terms of the electrical sector, that roughly a little less than a third could come from carbon capture and storage, both from fossil as well as natural gas. So one of the things that uh, Dr. Xi mentioned in his talk that we're also quite interested in is how do we work with the grid in order to be able to accommodate and balance 30% renewables at the same time is to modernize both the supply side as well as the demand side of, of the grid. And so with regard to the supply side of the grid, we have to be mindful that there needs to be digitization of a lot of our um, infrastructure. So it's often said, so I'll say it again, just not by me today, that if Edison came back, uh, Westinghouse, Tesla, they'd probably recognize our grid. You know? Now, if I held up a phone, clearly 
Alexander Graham Bell would not recognize it unless he bumped into Marconi and they put together wireless. But nonetheless, this is a, a real problem that, that we have and to think about how we make it both cyber and physically secure as well as to be able to prevent the kind of blackout that we experienced in August of 2005 which created a, a billion dollar loss revenue plus lights out for uh, many, many, many hours. One of the things that we're also mindful of is that we need a workforce that's educated in the so-called modern grid. And so one of the things that we did with the $4.5 billion smart grant investment grants from the Department of Energy is we put $100 million into workforce efforts that 54 grants in 24 states, many in universities and community colleges, in order to educate the new workforce uh, that will be required for a s smart grid. Now, one of the things that we can do once we have modernized the grid, I should say, is that we can achieve that 30% energy efficiency. And so this is a demand response from PG&E participants, an experiment that was done a couple years ago, uh, actually three years ago. And it showed that if during the high point of the day when you're turning on air condition on a Indian summer day like we've had here in the last few days, that you could actually dial down the electricity to your refrigerator while you're popping up the air conditioning and actually reduce your demand during the high point of the consumption in the late afternoon. What that does is a couple things. One is it does reduce energy use, helps us achieve that 30%. But it also takes out, of course, the peak power requirement. And what we see here in this particular slide in terms of generation and distribution that 25% of the distribution capacity serves and is required only 5% of the hours used per year. And the same with generation, that 10% of the generation assets are only employed 5% of the time. So we could ch save a tremendous amount of money, plus not have to build so-called peaking plants that tend not to be quite as efficient uh, in order to service that 5% load. So I've talked about how do we decarbonize the electrical sector, and I think it's, it's it's something that is technically doable and does not require heroic, necessarily, uh, feats of technology. But it will require a regulatory framework that gives a certain market signal that this is something that we value in the country. If we think about how we're going to decarbonize the transportation sector, and, and this is a view from, from the, uh, the unfortunate accident that took 11 lives in the Gulf, that we want to think about how do we move forward and decarbonize the transportation sector, we look, need to look at the fact that the light duty vehicles are about 60% of our greenhouse gas emissions, and the heavy trucks are about 20%, and the flight is about 9% of our emissions. So one of the things we've learned from our study is we look at biofuels, we probably want to take the one gigaton of biomass that we have and focus it on some of the areas that we can't easily electrify. So we can pretty straightforward electrify, well, straightforward is a I guess a term of art, and depends on who's using it, but let's just say that um, we have invested in the Department of Energy in manufacturing by 2011 50,000 plug-in hybrid electric vehicles per year, growing to 500,000 by 2014. We've invested in manufacturing batteries, so we go from 2% of the world market share to 40%. So we're, we're investing heavily in the electrification in the light duty fleet, but it's more difficult to electrify heavy truck and uh, the uh, heavy transportation in flight. So to do that, if we want to focus on biomass, we want to focus on biomass to be used for advanced biofuels to service the kind of markets that will be difficult to do um, by other means. So as I mentioned before, we've had 48 grants in 20 states on battery, battery manufacturing. This is actually the first battery off the line of a Detroit plant that was photographed in January of 2010. And that is addressing the light duty vehicle fleet in the heavy truck, we have a goal called super truck for the work truck to make the trucks 50% more efficient. And then recently, you've, you may have heard on Earth Day, the US Navy flew the Green Hornet, which is actually a 50-50 blend of, of uh, biofuels and, and uh, jet fuel blend so that flight by biofuels is being demonstrated. And we're heavily involved in biorefinery work. I believe there was. Um, uh, hundreds of millions, I don't remember, it's 400 or 800 million in biorefineries, both focused on jet fuel as well as uh, advanced biofuels and ethanol. So I believe that we can decarbonize the electrical sector, we can electrify the transportation sector. Uh, the important thing is going to be looking at energy efficiency. 40% of our energy use is in buildings, split almost 50-50 between residential and commercial. Now over the last 33 years, the Department of Energy has helped fund 
and support the weatherization of 6.4 million homes and low-income families. That's the good news. The other news is the building stock in the residential area is about 150 million homes. So how do we get to scale in energy efficiency? Uh, it is going to be critical that we reach scale because we need to keep our energy consumption flat from now till 2050. So one of the innovations that we've done in terms of how we support research and development at the Department of Energy is through uh, Secretary Chu's vision of the hubs. And we're supporting a hub in building systems. And the unique thing about this, and I, I think one of the many hallmarks of the Obama administration is how easy it is to work across agencies. We brought together seven agencies to put forward an energy regional innovation cluster focused on making buildings low energy or zero energy buildings. Now this, this we just announced this a couple weeks ago. It's $122 million. It will be centered at the old Navy Yard in Philadelphia where there's 200 buildings. They'll be looking at a microgrid as well as energy efficiency and making these buildings work together as a small community uh, to decrease greenhouse gas emissions and increase energy utilization. So we're very excited about that particular hub. The idea of a hub is to look at technology at scale. And that's one of our biggest problems with energy efficiency is how do we scale some of these things. So it'll look at the behavior, it'll look at the economics, it'll look at the codes and regulatory frameworks as well as the technology. So we're quite excited about that. Now if we do these things and we look at where we are at 2010 and we look at the energy migration out of the next 40 years, I would ask you to look at this graph for a minute and say, is this reasonable? And what we see is that there, there aren't any sharp discontinuities. In fact, if you were to look at the slope, and I, I don't have a ruler here, but you can look at the slope on nuclear. If we w drew a line from the first part of the 70s and kept building at that, we would easily reach our goal by 2050. And with renewables, if we look at the slope in the renewables that we've set with the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, we would more than reach the goal. So I think that, in, again, with hydro, none of these are sharp discontinuities in biomass. But it does mean that we need to be consistent. And we need to keep after this every day, every year, for the next 40 years. So if this seems reasonable, an obvious question to ask is, well, how much is it going to cost? Now, I've purposely not put in numbers because we're refining our estimates. And as you can see, there's also a range. But I think the interesting thing is what this is plotting is cumulative cash flow versus time. And so it does mean over the next, let's say, couple decades, there will be an upfront investment in decarbonizing our electricity and in energy efficiency. But like any good startup venture, it will turn cash flow positive, And the return will pay off tremendously, not only hopefully before 2050, but also beyond for the country. So the question is, how do we move that curve to the left and move the curve up? And I think that one of the things we've learned through the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act is projects that we required an 80% cost share on, in other words, we funded at 20% and the company funded at 80%, that might have accelerated the deployment, but it didn't stimulate new deployment. And projects that we funded at 60% and industry funded at 40% or 50-50 cost share, we we're turning people away. So the tipping point is probably somewhere between a cost share of a third to 40%. The only reason I say that, just from experience having you know, participated in this process over the last year, is that the government doesn't have to be the only one funding this initial investment. And if we do this right, you could actually reduce that curve by you know, maybe a factor of three. So I think it's quite interesting to say, what do we need to do now? And to think long term, a 40 year vision of what the return would be for the country. If we don't do that, and this is uh, from a paper by David Green called Measuring Energy Security, Can the United States Achieve Oil Independence? Uh, we'll continue, according to David Green, to have a cost to our economy of 135 billion a year from wealth transfer, dislocation losses, and loss of potential GDP growth. So I'm going to conclude with just a couple slides, which is something I'm very passionate about since we're at a university, and that is the workforce, because a lot of times that gets lost in the conversation. One of the things in the US we know is that from the Center for Energy Workforce Development, that 40 to 50% of our energy workforce will be of retirement age within the next decade. So how are we going to replace those workers? 
How are we going to get the, flip, the, the human capital to drive this clean energy economy? So one of the things that we did was we set, a, we, we set aside 100 million of smart grid investment grants to fund curriculum development, some in electrical engineering for smart grid. And I think I might have been the last class to take power engineering in the School of Engineering. And I hope, is it back? Not quite, okay. Well, what can I say? We'll talk later, okay. So, <laughs> and I was just about, my next, my next note is to applaud, and I am, uh, Dr. Benson, you, and also Dean Plummer for what you've done and the beautiful quad that you've built and the spectacular investment that Stanford has made in engineering, and not just in engineering, but the interdisciplinary engineering. All these centers have economists and earth scientists and, and behavioral scientists involved, and that is the wave of the future. But we have to get after this issue, and we have to support a more technically literate society, as well as the technical society that understands behavior and how to motivate change. One of the things that I've been pleased to be part of is the clean energy ministerial that Secretary Chu hosted for the first time in July that brought 20 energy ministers from around the world together was what we call the CE3 initiative, which is clean energy and empowerment for women. And Dr. Benson, you mentioned that up to three billion people still cook uh, in open fire or in cook stoves. And in fact, the criteria of pollutants in closed environment result in one person dying every 16 seconds from exposure. So Secretary Clinton at the Clinton Global Initiative last week, I was uh, honored to be part of launching a cook stove initiative, which is to develop with 50 million over the next five years, a highly efficient, low polluting cook stove for the uh, getting after this particular issue. But more, and more importantly uh, for the future is the individuals that the cooking actually impacts because we know that in Africa, for example, 80% of the energy is utilized by women. So that women and girls in Africa spend four to eight hours a day gathering wood, which means they don't have the opportunities for education and to uh, develop uh, to the maximum of their potential as well. So that's uh, one of the initiatives that we'll be launching and we have launched it and continue to work towards empowering women in education and energy. I also want to talk about a, a very large initiative that we have with our partners in China, which is the Clean Energy Research Centers. I was pleased to help develop and, and launch this a year ago, where we are just announced two of the centers in the US in electric vehicles and buildings, and uh, another one in carbon capture and sequestration. And this is a, a collaboration that we're very pleased to have with China as our partner. So thank you. I always like to conclude by um, talking about what we can do individually, because an awful lot of what we need to do together is determined in part by regulation and by bringing private capital off the sidelines. But we also can do a great deal. So yes, uh, if we utilize LEDs or compact fluorescent lights, if we change just one frequently used light bulb in each of those 150 million homes a year, we would save enough electricity to power three million homes. So for the holidays, I give everybody that's on my list compact fluorescent lights. Maybe this year they'll get LEDs. Um, the problem is that most of the people I know already have compact fluorescent lights in their homes. But it's a, a huge amount of savings. In terms of demand response, we know from the PGE experiment that we can save 20 to 30%. We know from looking at the data from the weatherization of the homes that we're saving over 30% with an investment of only 5,000 per home. If you do your laundry, and I know there's a lot of students here, so when you do get a chance to do your laundry, if you use a front loader and you use a cold water detergent, you can save 5% of the energy cost, which is huge. If you drive one less 10-mile trip per week, so 20 miles round trip, you save over 120 million tons of CO2, which is a, a tremendous saving, taking tens of millions of cars off the road. If you put your laptop in sleep mode, it'll go from 65 watts to just one watt. And uh, lastly, if we can, weatherize our homes and look at ways of participating so that we can save 30%. I do believe by 2050 we can achieve that particular savings. So I'm very optimistic about the future. I, I love to end with this particular quote uh, by Bill Anders in uh, Apollo 8 Astronaut, which is, we've come all this way to explore the moon, and the most important thing we discovered is Earth. And if we look carefully at this picture of the Earth, you see what looks like a little blue ring around the planet. And I think of that as, of course, it's our atmosphere, but it reminds me of the shell of an egg. And what we've been doing over the last 150 years is making that 
shell fragile. And it's time to strengthen that together in partnership with our friends in uh, the rest of the world. So I'll conclude here. And um, if we have time, take some questions. Thank you very much. I was interested in how uh, little you had to say about natural gas. Right. When we think about uh, decarbonization, or, or certainly reduction of carbonization, both of electricity uh, and of uh, transportation, right. it would appear that there would be a significant interim role for natural gas, that when you compare the, the uh, carbon emissions from natural gas versus coal, that uh, the su that substitution would have some important impact on reducing carbon emissions looked at over the next few sure. decades. And the, co the cost issues are there, but with some of the new drilling techniques, it looks like we can get natural gas at a reasonable price. And right. from a national security standpoint, uh, we can get a lot of natural gas within the United States. Could, sure. I'm, I'm wondering why you just didn't have more to say about that. Uh, so when I talk about fossil, I, I assume, and my apologies, uh, I'm talking about coal and natural gas, okay? So talking about sequestration, we're talking about natural gas combined cycle as well with carbon capture and sequestration. So think about whenever I said fossil, it's talking about gas. So obviously natural gas is an important part of what we wanna do in the future. And one of the interesting things we've been debating is that, you know, if you, uh, and we've been seeing is that folks who have coal-fired assets are replacing them with natural gas, and Progress Energy just announced they're going to retrofit 12 plants. So we see that coming, and, and we're happy for that because you can just as easily sequester the CO2 from a natural gas-fired plant as from coal. Uh, in the heavy truck transportation sector, looking at natural gas makes a lot of sense as well. I think when you think about now combined heat and power and doing that with natural gas, then it becomes a little bit more difficult to think about, do I look at it as an interim because as you said, 40% less emissions, but then are those assets gonna be stranded out of 2050? And if we do it now, I agree, if we have a plan to continue to incrementally uh, distribute national, natural gas, and I'm not going to have the opportunity to sequester, then I see that as more of a problem. So we're absolutely positive about natural gas. It's just a matter of how, when, and where, <laughs> as usual. But um, yeah, didn't mean to ignore it at all. It is part of our plan. The only other thing, yeah, and the only thing I'd say is uh, what people tell us is, well, you know, it's so volatile. I think that it's certainly the market is going to have to calm down a little bit as our uh, natural gas uh, resources become verified, as we estimate. So absolutely in agreement. Hi. Thanks again for your um, talk this morning. Uh, in Australia, we had an interesting market distortion where the government uh, incentivized um, the installation of all these homes. And then there's this big rush of unqualified people to install right. um, insulators in the homes, which resulted in uh, fires and other things and, and, um, and, and fraud. And I was wondering if you could comment on how you think about these massive chunks of financial incentive and stimulation and, uh, and the impact of market distortions and any, any, any sort of consequences um, that could result that might be more harmful than, than good. Sure. So as part of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, that $36 billion, $12 billion was in energy efficiency. $5 billion was in weatherization of low-income homes. So we are um, very focused on making sure that the installers are qualified, bonded, and that we don't have fraud. And I've personally gone out and visited some of the training centers, went to Indiana. I've gone and visited five states and their energy offices to talk about how they're setting up the programs. All of these are reviewed and qualified and monitored. So this is just the start. We will continue to, not only do we do the installation, we come back and we audit it to make sure it's functioning the way it is. So that's with regard to the weatherization part. I, I think in, in general, when you think about you know, some of the incentives, sure, that's uh, going to be always a possibility, but I think I'm, I'm very confident that what we've done from the government perspective is to have that at front and center. Going forward, it, it's sort of, I had uh, some interesting conversations at breakfast this morning about how you incent people to make the kind of changes that we want. Because we can't do it just from the government. We don't have enough money, first of all. You know, at $10 billion for 
you know, a few million homes, it doesn't scale. So we've got to figure out a way to incent all of us to commit to doing it and to be rewarded. And I think that's, that's a little bit more of a challenge, but we're working through it. Madam Undersecretary, thank you for your awesome presentation today. Um, for years, the media messaging about issues related to the energy and the environment has been overwhelmingly negative. Uh, we're always losing things like glaciers and species and opportunities. Um, you started your own talk off today with pictures of that glacier in Glacier National mm -hmm. Park and its recession, and then you followed up with commentary on the ed editorial about hopeless pessimism. So my question is, how might you be able to better package the message such that we're referring to gains that we're attracting through our research rather than just always accentuating the negative imaging that is so prevalent in the minds of, of citizens here? Sure. Thank you. Well, I think that's a great question. So um, it's important to accentuate the positive, and I think one of the great things is what we're seeing in terms of plug-in hybrid vehicle investments. I think it's great that we'll go from 50,000 plug-in hybrids within a few years to 500,000. If you think about how long it took for the Priuses to get to a million, it was a decade, right? So in terms of the acceleration, I think that's very positive. I think that the demonstration CCS are referred to is, is, is stellar, and that was a great meeting and, uh, of tremendous enthusiasm with the governor and the senators in West Virginia to get after carbon capture and sequestration. So, there is a lot of positive, and I'll take that to heart. I might leave the glacier slide till the end and talk about all the positive things going forward. But I do think it's important that we be realistic and that we focus on having people know this is a big problem. We all have to act. We all should go home and get rid of all our light bulbs. We all should take and commit to driving less and being more efficient. And I think that unless people see the urgency then I, I think it's difficult to, to change. That you could refer to that corresponds to showing like a glacier that's actually growing? <laughs> or, or, or is the use of glaciers in your, in your imaging perhaps going to lead to just cycling endless pessimism? That's the question, sorry, thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I share your optimism about our engineer's ability to reach these technological milestones that we need to accomplish everything you talked about. But I'm wondering if uh, the DOE has thought about the difficulties of implementing a 40-year plan on two, four, and six-year election cycles, and if there are ways, or because not all of the federal government is run on those cycles. So right, I'm wondering right. if they're, you know, looking forward as we address these policies, what's, how can we think about how to make sure that this kind of plan stays intact throughout the decades? You know, I, that's a great question. <laughs> um, I think that we have a lot of leaders. I think obviously California has been a leader in showing what is possible and what can be done. And I think that the communication education is uh, very important. I've been thinking about um, how we get the message out. There's these, these two young girls in Florida, and they green their school, and they save their school 30000 a year in the first year and 40000 the next year. If they did that across the district, they, they estimate that the district would save $30 million. So how do we get a competition going with greening the schools to get the kids that are so excited and so turned on about saving the planet they're inheriting? And I think those are some of the things that we can do as, as citizens to move this agenda forward and to show it's important to our elected officials. So, you know, I, I, I'm very optimistic about implementing a 40-year plan, even though we have these cycles. Johnson, um, you spoke about doubling nuclear capacity in the U.S., and yes. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the role of small modular reactors in that, um, both in terms of timing and then scale relative right. to that. You know, I think so. Uh, what the question is referring to: small modular reactors are, are size of a nuclear reactor that's less than 300 megawatts. So the typical AP1000 would be around 1,000 megawatts, maybe up to 1,200, 1,300. You know, I think they're quite interesting, and I think the reason why they're interesting for a number of reasons. One is that hopefully they could be uh, proliferation proof. Uh, second thing is that they could be factory built so that you can get economies of scale. You don't need the large forgers to make them. And I think that for decentralized systems in places where we could, uh, for example, uh, some of our DOE sites, 
that could drive the electricity there that would be about matched to that kind of small modular reactor electrical power would be quite interesting. So um, I, I think that small modular reactors are, are quite an exciting potential for the future. Madam Secretary, you've talked about uh, federal support for uh, energy policies, uh, and right now we have programs like the uh, investment tax credit, which are right. um, uh, useful but complicated for many, uh, uh, especially smaller producers yeah. to use uh, and expensive to, to finance. Right. Sure. We have other models um, internationally, particularly in Europe, uh, for renewable energy uh, using things like um, uh, feed-in tariffs and, and other uh, standard contracts for purchasing renewable energy. And I'm wondering uh, what thought there is of, of using that sort of approach in this country where it's been so successful elsewhere. Right. So some of the things that we've done that we've seen to be very successful are the 1603 grants in lieu of tax credits, the 4.8 billion that we did with between DOE and Department of Treasury. And that funded a lot of smaller entities that didn't want to go or couldn't go through the expense as well as the time of the larger loan guarantees. And we're looking at now with the loan guarantee program how we can um, structure something that would be more appropriate for small companies. So stay tuned. I, I can't comment where we are right now with that. But I think also the 1703 and the 1705 um, opportunities for small businesses, the small business innovative research programs, we've been making them more commercially relevant. And one of the things I didn't mention, but with the investment by the Department of Energy, we've ramped up to now creating 50,000 jobs per quarter. So what we're doing through these particular mechanisms, I believe it, you know, is working quite well and will continue to stimulate this kind of activity in the private sector, but we can always do more. Thank you. So I should preface that by saying that I'm always very critical of uh, top-down um, energy mixes that are drawn up in multiple colors. So I looked very closely at your um, yeah. initial slide or on slide five, and I was very surprised to see that the field of uh, renewable electricity showed uh, a pronounced growth until the year 2030 in that graph, yeah. um, and then kind of seemed to stagnate a bit. Mm -hmm. um, so now we're here um, in, a, in a room where people are thinking about like long-term research, right. high risk, high reward that might right. pay out in this 2025 and, and after time frame. So I was wondering what kind of we should take of that as the message. So I uh, would like to ask you uh, what we should think of it and sure. maybe, um, maybe you should take as a challenge uh, to show that actually these learning curves can kind of go significantly, right. significantly beyond that. Right. Great question. Absolutely should take it as a challenge. This was a, um, you know, I think that the role of government is not to pick a winner, but it's to say if we have a portfolio right now, it could be renewables, it could be nuclear, it can be carbon capture and storage on both natural gas as well as coal. It's really up to whatever is going to get cheapest, fastest. So what we can do is help hit the R&D barriers, which allows the market to understand what it would look like in deployment after the first, second, or third demonstration. I mean, honestly, do I know what the mix is going to look like in 2030 or 2050? No. But I think that by looking at a portfolio, you can see that it's reasonable. Assuming you have the right regulatory conditions, there's nothing heroic necessarily that needs to be done. There will need to be heroes that can solve those problems, but nothing that is you know, of the kind of the scale that I think, you know, that I was referring to to be a bit provocative in, in referring to the editorial. So, yeah, it's a medium case where you sort of say, if we had a bit of each of these, could you make it? And that's really the intent. It's very similar also to EPRI has a PRISM analysis, which you may have seen, PRISM 1.0. The difference is that EPRI, I do, uh, in looking at it, is um, not factoring in natural gas as much. Um, and we're both looking at the economic impact right now. Um, one of the um, assumptions that you've been making, and you've said a number of times today, is having the right regulatory environment. Right. And for the past two years, the Obama administration has had a democratically controlled Congress, but there hasn't been the ability to get a climate change bill passed or a renewable electricity standard passed. So I'm just wondering how uh, realistic is it to, to expect any of these things to happen? Are there other mechanisms that can happen if that are there that can be used if we don't have a long-term energy policy for this country? 
First of all, I'm, and I'm pretty optimistic we will have a long-term energy policy. I, I do believe we will have legislation. I, I can't tell you, what, obviously, what that's going to be, but I think we will. Um, so that's one thing. And two is I think that we've seen uh, CAFE standards be raised and certain uh, authorities that exist through the agencies that also will be helpful in this in area. So I remain very positive that we will move towards this goal. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Madam Secretary, I was uh, really thrilled to see you talk about the individual responsibilities that each of us can do, because yeah. it's very important. That's how we accrete this capture. Mm -hmm. And we need to look at where is it, what actions that we do that produce the largest greenhouse gas emissions, if that's what the objective is. And so it's important to focus on that for a minute. And when I looked at all the statistics that the Energy Information Agency provides, or some of the other compilations, we talk about the commercial residential sector, the industrial sector, and the transportation sector. Food is subsumed in all of them. And yet, when you add up all the little emissions associated in the food chain, from the growing to the processing to the eating and transportation and everything, it adds up to being a very large, about 40% of our greenhouse gas emissions. Could be, could be as large as, as some analysis have shown by Lester Brown and some others, Eshel Martin. Mm -hmm. The amount of savings in switching diets yeah. could be as much as changing from a suburban driving 10,000 right. miles a year to a Prius. Right. And that overshadows switching light bulbs. And I would like to see more emphasis or kind of pulling into the food side in some compilations yeah. that uh, the department provides. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I hear you. Thank you. I think we have to do it all. <laughs> so thank you for your talk. My question is pretty simple. Uh, by talking to uh, the VCs in the Silicon Valley, they are basically the, one of the driver engines for innovations. They say that uh, they told me basically from the investment viewpoint, it's very difficult to uh, just uh, use in the uh, VC kind of mechanisms to, uh, to drive the uh, green tech development. So my question is, uh, where do we really get all these financial resources that's necessary, especially for the short term and the long term? So I think that's one of the very open questions. And you know, that's where you have a certain investment that we need in order to you know, move to the cash flow positive. And it's not as easy as saying, well, we just won't import oil and we'll use those funds to do something else. So I think that's yet to be uh, articulated. And I'm certainly uh, not going to do that now. But um, I think that that's a big challenge to everybody in the room is to figure out how we're going to create the incentive, particularly in the energy efficiency side, to make it pay for us to do the kinds of things. I mean, I, I look, one, one, just one little comment. So I, I was at my Stanford reunion a year ago. I won't tell you which one. I stayed at the Sofitel up here. And I went through all the halls, and I counted all the lights that were on that I didn't think needed to be on. And then I did it, went online, and I looked at all the Sofitels in the, in the world. And then I looked at their share price, and then I calculated how much they'd save. And, and so, there's got to be a way that we can illuminate to the leadership of all these companies, corporations, universities of what can be saved. And we have to organize that and have to do that in a way that's very compelling to show people we will save money by doing this. And I think it's just that, we, that it's just not believed. So I think part of it is getting the data. And that's what we're trying to do through our Recover, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act is getting the data on these smart grid investment grants and the weatherization so we can show and document what can be done with this kind of investment. So stay tuned. Um, here and then back there. Thanks. Hey, yeah, um, there's been um, a great deal of difficulty getting a climate bill through, yeah. obviously, and uh, particularly one with any sort of carbon tax. Uh, can you expect during the Obama administration, in lieu of uh, any climate bills, any sort of EPA restrictions on CO2 emissions, which I guess the Supreme Court had uh, allowed them to do? Well, I know that that's being discussed heavily right now, but I, I don't think anybody's got a crystal ball on, on that. So I'll, I'll pass on that particular question. But you know, I'm, again, very optimistic that the Obama administration, which is very focused on building a clean energy economy and energy security, that we will see positive out outcome. And I'll just leave it at that right now. In the context of a greatly expanded nuclear program, could you say a few words about uh, nuclear waste disposal? Sure. 
So obviously managing the fuel cycle is going to be huge. As you know, Secretary Chu has stood up a blue ribbon commission of experts balanced bipartisan to look at what are the opportunities for managing the back end of the fuel cycle to reduce the amount of waste and to uh, be able to just manage how we would grow the nuclear industry. You know, right now I think that um, storage is key to that, but I also, where, where they're stored now, I think that the um, Nuclear Regulatory Commission came out with saying that the safety was at least 100 years where they are, or hundreds of years, maybe it was 300 years. So I think that we've got some time to figure this out, and we have been working on it for the last 40 years, and we will continue to work on that, and I believe if you look at the FY11 budget, whenever we get that, that there is an investment in our fuel cycle R&D, so I'm positive that we'll get there. So we're gonna do three more. We're gonna do one here, one here, and one here, and then we're gonna break. I know that uh, Under Secretary uh, Kathy Zoe is doing a lot to uh, revise the DOE website and to mm -hmm. get the messages out uh, on successes that DOE is doing. Could you describe a little bit of that and what kind of outreach is being done, uh, again, in terms of education of the public? Sure, I, I think that uh, through the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, we have a big outreach to try and highlight in a whole range of opportunities what we're doing in terms of not only what the DOE is doing, but if you look at the EIA website within the Department of Energy, they have a tremendous education, especially targeted towards younger kids. So I think that Department of Energy is uh, focused on this. We just hired a, a new, um, web designer and looking at ways of getting out the message using web 2.0 type tools. So stay tuned. I think you'll see a lot more coming out from the Department of Energy. Uh, yes, yeah, so one of the things you didn't... Uh... Oh, okay. One of the things you didn't uh, uh, mention was uh, um, uh, energy storage. And uh, mm. in particular, uh, grid energy storage, which could right. have benefits with respect to maybe decreasing the infrastructure cost as well as efficiency right. of the grid. And then maybe localized storage near intermittent sources such as solar and uh, wind sure. uh, facilities. Right. I, I didn't spend a lot of time on, on that, but we're quite interested in, in pump storage. We have some pump storage projects. The one I mentioned was in uh, Warren, uh, Pennsylvania. Yeah, so it'll be interesting to see how when these plug-in hybrids are available, you know, how they're used in terms of developing a distributed on-site storage for the grid and for the grid operators and who owns the electrons and how they get re, re, uh, reshaped and shipped. So I'm looking forward to that. You know, we've invested a lot in the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act through RPE on storage, uh, metal air batteries, uh, all sorts of batteries, mainly focused on the electrifying the transportation sector. But we're also working with our um, power marketing agencies in terms of pump storage and compressed air. So it is on our mind. I didn't say too much about it, but definitely we're considering it. First of, first of all, I want to thank you for giving us a talk to us. And <clears throat> your long-term direction seems absolutely correct. And there's no reason why we cannot get there. The only problem, as we all know, is get it going. One thing I learned from the previous speaker is China set some targets for the industries to meet. If you don't meet them, sorry, uh, the government will come and, and take care of you. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's very powerful. Now, we don't have that mechanism. However, let me give you a suggestion. The government itself owns huge buildings and right. factories and people and cars. Why doesn't the government put some guidelines to where, where the government will spend their uh, energy and have all, you know, efficient right. electric, uh, electric uh, cars and so forth? For example, I think Secretary Chu said, paint the buildings uh, white on the right. roof. Right. Well, if you look at the Department of Energy, the roof is not white. Right. <laughs> So, it soon will be white, trust no, but, me. But my so point me, is... Yeah, I, and it's a great, great question. And I'm so glad you mentioned that because we have an executive order from the Council on Economic, uh, I mean, the Council on Environmental Quality to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions across the government by 28% by 2020. 
So we have actually put a marker down to do that. I think we have ways that we can far exceed that. So it's doing exactly what you're saying, and you're exactly right on. So um, that's the first thing. The second thing is that we're also working on um, using the government buying power to buy power and buy clean, uh, clean power. So we have some projects that are looking at the needs, uh, particularly in um, Ford operations uh, bases, that sort of thing, which become great test beds for how we can deploy clean energy. So you're exactly right, and I appreciate you bringing that up. I did want to mention that we are trying to be part of the solution. Thank you. Well, please join me in, uh, in thanking uh, Secretary. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.